Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are describing type 1 activation of endothelial cells. Okay, so in this next video, what we're going to do is just describe one more uh, structure of a blood vessel. We're going to describe the structure of these arterioles because these are going to be important in um, the inflammatory process as well. And you're going to get activation of the endothelial cells here as well. So you're actually going to get activation of endothelial cells in both the arterioles, the capillaries, and the venules, in all three of those. And they're going to have slightly different effects at different places. So the activation in the arterioles is going to be extremely important in producing the vasodilatation. So here, what's going to happen is when the endothelial cells are activated, they'll produce nitric oxide and um, prostacyclin, and we'll see how in a moment. Uh, Whereas in the capillaries and the venules, what's going to happen is that you're also going to get the production of those molecules, but it's not really to much avail because neither of these have smooth muscle cells surrounding them. Okay. Instead, what's important here is that the endothelial cells contract and open up these junctions between them so that m fluid can leave the blood and go into the interstitial fluid, uh, and also that they... Uh, start putting molecules on their cell surface uh, which are capable of um, grabbing onto white blood cells uh, in the blood and then they can be moved into the interstitial fluid to fight our Staphylococcus aureus. So, let's just discuss the structure of an arteriole then. Okay, so an arteriole then. So, these are rather more complicated than the venules and the capillaries, so they have a number of layers. Okay, so, right at the centre, you have the lumen here. Okay, and then surrounding the lumen, we have our endothelial cells, which I won't draw with their little bumps that I did before, I'll just draw them as smooth cells, like here. But here are their nuclei. Okay. And then these endothelial cells are still sitting on a basement membrane of collagen. So let's add in the basement membrane. Okay, so in turquoise here, this is the basement membrane on which the endothelial cells are sitting. Okay, however, now you have a whole bunch of other um, layers around that. Remember, this was pretty much what a venule consisted of. It just consisted of these endothelial cells with a basement membrane around it, whereas this arteriole consists of far more layers, basically. It has the endothelial cells with the basement membrane around it, then it has a layer known as the subendothelial connective tissue, which I'll show here in red. Okay surrounding the basement membrane. Now, the basement membrane consists mainly of collagen, and so does the subendothelial connective tissue. So, I'll label up the new portion. So, this is the subendothelial connective tissue, also often referred to as the subendothelial space. So, either of those names is fine. Right, then surrounding the subendothelial space, what you have is a portion known as the internal elastic lamina, which I'll show in blue here. And this is made of a very, oops, of a elastic protein, okay? So it's not collagen. Collagen's not very elastic. Okay, instead it's elastin, okay? So elastin is a protein that's very elastic, and that's why its name is elastin. Okay, so this is the internal elastic lamina surrounding the subendothelial space. Right, and now these four layers together, the endothelial cells, uh, the basement membrane on which the endothelial cells are sitting, the subendothelial space, and the internal elastic lamina, all of those together are known as the tunica intima. So all four of these layers together are known as tunica intima. Tunica means layer, okay? Intima means close, so this is the layer which is close to the blood, because the blood will be moving inside here. Okay, so that's the Chinica Intima. Right, then, surrounding the internal elastic lamina, what you have is a layer of smooth muscle cells. So we'll have our layer of smooth muscle cells 
as all of what's left, okay? So, this is full of smooth muscle cells, and these smooth muscle cells are arranged basically in rings. So these are the smooth muscle cells, and they go round the blood vessel in rings, like so. Oops. Okay, and I might as well complete this now, we're almost there. Okay, I'll make a few longer smooth muscle cells. Okay, so you get these complete rings of smooth muscle cell. Now, what's the significance of this? Well, if you can imagine what's going to happen when these smooth muscle cells contract, well, they're all going to decrease in length, okay? Now, if every single one of these smooth muscle cells decreases in length, then the entire circumference of this ring of smooth muscle cells is also going to decrease in length, okay? Uh, and if the cir a circle's circumference decreases, then its diameter also decreases. I mean, the circumference is equal to pi times the diameter. So the diameter is the circumference divided by pi. So if the circumference decreases, the diameter also decreases, okay? And, um, Basically, just intuitively, if the circumference decreases, you know, the diameter of the ring is going to decrease. So if the diameter of this ring of smooth muscle cells increases, decreases rather, that's going to decrease the diameter of the lumen as well. So the smooth muscle cell layer can control the diameter of the blood vessel lumen, basically. And you're not just going to have one ring of smooth muscle cells surrounding this lumen. You'll have multiple rings of smooth muscle cells. So these are vascular smooth muscle cells here. Okay, often abbreviated to VSMC for short, vascular smooth muscle cells. Okay, now surrounding the vascular smooth muscle cell layer, which by the way is known as tunica media. Okay, so tunica means layer, media means middle. Okay, so it's the middle layer, tunica media. Surrounding Chinica media, what you then have is what's known as the external elastic lamina. So you have another layer of elastin. Whoops, that's gone off. Got a little bulge of elastin there. Okay. And this is surrounding the smooth muscle layer, and this is known as the external elastic lamina. So in blue, this is the external elastic lamina. And then surrounding the external elastic lamina, you finally have the final layer of the blood vessel, which is known as the, um, well, it consists of uh, collagen, okay? And this layer of collagen surrounding uh, the external elastic lamina, along with the external elastic lamina itself, together they are known as tunica adventitia, okay? So this is this layer, oh dear, what's happening? No, it's just the yellow isn't showing up very well. So this layer of ye yellow uh, denotes this le layer of collagen that is external to uh, the in external elastic lamina. And together, this layer of collagen with the external elastic lamina, those two layers together, so this layer and this layer, are known as tunica adventitia. Okay? Or they're also... Uh, more modernly referred to as tunica externa for the external layer. Okay, so tunica adventitia or tunica externa. Right, okay, so this is the structure of an arteriole, and I promise our hard work in drawing these structures out will be worth it when we come to try and understand what the effects of all these uh, endothelial cells undergoing type 1 activation is going to be. Okay, so we'll now turn our attention to the pathways underlying type 1 activation within an endothelial cell. So, in our tissue, where we have our uh, Staphylococcus aureus growing nice and happily like a bunch of grapes, um, basically the mast cells don't like this, and they have released histamine, this alert signal, if you like. Okay, and histamine is going to go to the uh, blood vessels, and it's not the only thing. There are a huge number of inflammatory mediators. We're taking histamine as our prime sort of example, and it is one of the prime examples. It's the archetypal example, okay? And uh, what it's going to do is it's going to go to the endothelial cells on the arterioles, the capillaries, and the venules within your tissue. So your tissue will have arterioles, capillaries, and venules. Okay, it's going to go to all of them, 
okay, and it's going to cause type 1 activation of the endothelial cells. Now, how is this going to work? Well, let's see. So basically, if we draw an endothelial cell here, so here is our endothelial cell, and whichever blood vessel type it's sitting on, so, well, whichever, whichever blood vessel type it's in, it is sitting on a layer of collagen known as the uh, basement membrane, okay? Right, so these endothelial cells have on their basolateral membrane receptors for histamine. Okay, or we'll generalize this slightly and say that the, they have receptors for inflammatory mediators, of which histamine is an example. Okay, now, these receptors for the inflammatory mediators, and if I just draw the basolateral membrane here, they are G-protein coupled receptors. Okay, so here is our G-protein coupled receptor. And remember, G-protein coupled receptors have these seven membrane-spanning domains. Okay, so this is a GPCR for short, a G-protein coupled receptor. Okay, and it will have a ligand that will come and bind to it. Now, as I say, there are a huge number of different inflammatory mediators that can cause type 1 activation of endothelial cells. And I want to stress this, histamine is not the only one, okay? They will, all these different inflammatory mediators will have different receptors, so they'll all have their own receptor on the basolateral membrane of the endothelial cell, but they will all be G-protein coupled receptors, and they'll all be coupled to the GQ, heterotrimeric G-protein, which we'll come to in a moment. But if you want a concrete example of what's going to cause our type 1 activation, we can continue to think of this as histamine, so we can piece this story together. So histamine is going to be our archetypal ligand, and our G-protein coupled receptor is therefore going to be the H1 receptor for histamine 1 receptor, okay? But there are a number of other inflammatory mediators, and they will all have their own uh, G-protein coupled receptors, which they will bind to and activate the GQ, heterotrimeric G-protein. Okay, so histamine has come in and bound to its G-protein coupled receptor on the basolateral membrane of our endothelial cell. Okay, now what this will do is it's going to activate our uh, heterotrimeric G-protein. So let's draw our heterotrimeric G-protein here. Okay, so heterotrimeric G-proteins consist of three subunits, okay? So this is a, where should I write its name? This is a hetero trimeric G protein, and they are called heterotrimeric G proteins because they consist of three, so that's the trimeric, and different, that's the hetero, uh, subunits. Okay, so they have an alpha subunit, a beta subunit in the middle here, and a gamma subunit on the end over there. Okay, now the name of the heterotrimeric G protein i.e. when people say, oh, this is a GQ, heterotrimeric G protein, what that refers to is which alpha subunit you are using. Okay, so in the human genome, there are 16 different alpha subunits for heterotrimeric G proteins. There are 5 different beta subunits, and there are 12 different gamma subunits. Okay, so when people refer to a heterotrimeric G protein and say that it's a GQ heterotrimeric G protein, what that actually means is that the alpha subunit is the alpha Q subunit. So alpha Q is one of these 16 alpha subunits. And basically, if you say that your heterotrimeric G protein is a GQ, all that tells us is that the alpha subunit is alpha Q. It does not tell you which beta and gamma subunit you have. So the G protein is named after which alpha subunit it has. Okay, so, all G proteins can have two states. They have an on state and an off state. And in the off state, they have guanosine diphosphate, GDP, linked to them. And in the on state, they have guanosine triphosphate linked to them. Specifically, the guanosine nucleotide is bound to the alpha subunit in a heterotrimeric G protein. Okay, so this G protein is currently in the off state because I've drawn it with GDP bound to it. Okay, so when histamine binds to the H1 receptor or when our 
pro-inflammatory ligand uh, binds to its GPCR, what it's going to do is it's going to um, interact with this uh, GQ, heterotrimeric G protein. It's going to become catalytically active, and it's going to chop off this guanosine diphosphate from the alpha subunit, and it's going to bind on a, a GTP, a guanosine triphosphate, on there instead. Okay, so you're going to get GTP, guanosine triphosphate, bound to your alpha Q subunit. Okay, now once the alpha Q subunit has GTP bound to it, it no longer wants to associate with the beta and the gamma subunit, okay? So it cleaves away from the beta and the gamma subunits. So here is the beta subunit, and here is the gamma subunit, and they break away, basically. So beta and the gamma subunit go off, and they're now referred to as the beta-gamma subunit, because they remain bound to one another, so they still have each other, even though alpha Q has decided that it would rather not know them. Okay, so... Both of these are actually going to be involved in our type 1 activation. We'll start with what alpha QGTP does, and we'll come back to what beta gamma does later. Okay, and we'll continue this discussion in the next video.